All right. I call this meeting of the property tax division to order pursuant to rule 10.01. The first order of business is that we need to take a roll to determine who's present. The clerk, Mr. Peterson, will take the roll. Chair Joachim? Present. Joachim, present. Vice Chair Gomez? Present. Gomez, present. Representative Hurtas? Hurtas, present. Hurtas, present. Representative Anderson? Anderson, present. Anderson, present. Representative Becker Finn? Present. Becker Finn, present. Representative Fisher? Fisher, present. Fisher, present. Mm -hmm. Representative Green is excused. Representative Hassan? Representative Hassan? Representative Her? Present. Her, present. Representative Marcourt? Marcourt, present. Marcourt, present. Representative Mortensen excused. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, present. Pulowski, present. Representative Torkelson? Torkelson, present. Torkelson, present. Representative Hassan? Representative Hassan. We have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. All right. Um, I want to note that all the committee documents for today have been sent to members and are in the committee packets on the House website. Uh, that includes the first item on our agenda, which is the minutes. Uh, Representative Marcourt, Chair Marcourt, have you had a chance to look at the February 2nd minutes? I have, and I will move approval of the February 2nd, 2022 minutes. Thank you, Chair Marcourt. Does anyone have any questions about those minutes? I'll wait a second here. Seeing none, if any, everybody can unmute, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor of approving the February 2nd minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The motion is approved and the amendments are adopted. So the first item on our agenda, which also has materials in your packets, is House File 2800. Representative Hurtas, would you like to move that your bill be laid over for possible inclusion in the property tax division report? Thank you, Madam Chair, and that is my motion. I'd like to have this bill possibly laid over for inclusion. Thank you, uh, Representative Hurtas. With that, you may present your bill. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, House File 28 is a bill that uh, deals with the interest rate on delinquent property taxes. For those of you who receive a property tax statement, you may have looked at the reverse side of it and notice that if you don't pay your property taxes on time, there's both a penalty on a monthly basis and an interest rate. And these uh, both uh, kind of work in tandem and accumulate it against the unpaid balance until paid. So members, um, some historical context uh, for those who maybe were property tax payers back in the 70s, we had a double digit inflation rates and uh, it's my recollection that uh, way back then, uh, the interest rate was raised on delinquent property taxes to be commensurate with the market at that time. Uh, subsequently, um, our market has changed and the interest rates have been extraordinarily low for a very long time. And uh, this uh, minimum interest rate still remains in statute. And so to that uh, is what this bill is trying to address and uh, make it uh, less expensive for people to pay their delinquent property taxes and to redeem uh, their property if they should find themselves in foreclosure. And with that, Madam Chair, I do have uh, Mr. Ron Elwood, who has been working on this issue for some time. And Mr. Elwood and I have uh, been aligned in uh, other past uh, issues regarding housing. And I'm happy to work with him on this uh, bill. And uh, he's uh, somewhere in the um, Hollywood squares here of people <laughs> we're, we're looking at. Uh, so if you, Madam Chair, if you'd call on Mr. Elwood, I'm sure he'd be able to give you some more context. Thank you, Representative Hurtas. Mr. Elwood, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, you Madam Chair and members. Uh, Ron Elwood uh, with Legal Aid. And uh, first, I just want to thank Representative Hurtas for carrying this bill. It's always a pleasure to work with him. Uh, and Chair Joachim, thank you so much for hearing it and co-authoring it. I really appreciate it. 
Um, this statute was put in place back in 1990 when the 30 year fixed interest mortgage rate was 10.13. Um, just by contrast, the rate as of December 2nd, 2021 was 3.05. Um, and the rate uh, has not reached double digits in, since November 1991. Under the current statute, uh, annually, the Department of Revenue is uh, obligated to set the interest rate uh, based on a uh, uh, six month, uh, the prime rate charged by banks during a six month period uh, ending on September 30th. And that, that as I said, the rate, uh, the most recent rate was 3.05. Um, but the law says that if the rate is lower than 10%, then the rate shall be 10%. So in effect, it's a floor of 10%, which obviously is exceedingly high, so out of step with current rates. And uh, the reason that this is so important is because it creates a barrier for homeowners to repurchase their homes once they hit tax forfeiture. And of course, nobody wants the counties, nobody wants the, the, the homes to, to go into tax forfeiture. It's much better if the homeowner can redeem. And so that is the purpose of this bill. I wanna thank the Association of Minnesota Counties and uh, MICA as well for uh, their help on this bill and their support of the bill. Happy to answer any questions. Appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Elwin. I want to note that Representative Hassan has arrived um, and also that we opened up um, to, uh, testimony to members of the public and no one has signed up. Um, members, are there any questions for Representative Hurtas? Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this could be for Mr. Elwood or Representative Hurtas. Um, I had some folks contact me asking about the process, this entire process of buying back forfeited property. And they were saying that somebody could make a minimal payment, $100 a month or something to keep keep their the property from going into foreclosure. And then I talked to some assessors and auditors and they said, no, there's a three-year process where you can establish a payment plan to get back in, in the current, current status. So Mr. Elwood, what is the process for a person or a family trying to get property back out of foreclosure? You could generally give us uh, how it's done. Thank um, you. Thank you, Representative Anderson, uh, for that question. Thank you, Chair, you came. Um, you know, there's, there's several ways that property can go into foreclosure. Probably the most frequent is for non-payment of a mortgage. Uh, however, <clears throat> you can also uh, go into uh, forfeiture for non-payment of property taxes. Um, what you alluded to, uh, many counties do have a program where you come in and you sign what they call a confession of judgment. Uh, you sign a confession of judgment that you do owe the money, and then you enter into a payment plan. Um, as is the case with with residential property, you have to be delinquent seven years for the property uh, to be foreclosed on and with other classes of property it's usually three years so <clears throat> those are kind of the triggers and usually the remedies uh, you really you really don't uh, you start the foreclosure process or the foreclosure process has started but you really don't forfeit the property until after sheriff sale and even then you still have some redemption periods but what this bill is aiming to do is to make it less cumbersome and less costly to uh, get current and to get your property tax paid and and uh, not be a barrier to keeping your property. Mr. Thank you, Representative Hurtas. Uh, Mr. Elwood, did you have anything else to add? No, I mean, I, I think uh, only that I think uh, Representative Anderson was the, the point that he made where the counties will enter into a payment agreement with the homeowner um, the objective is obviously they want the properties to stay with the homeowner, get the property taxes paid. So they're going to be as, as lenient as they can to try to get, get that uh, homeowner back in the home. So I think the payment agreement piece is, is really what the, the fundamental way to get a homeowner out of forfeiture and back into their home and current on their taxes. Representative Anderson, follow up. No, no further comments. Thank you. Members, are there any further questions for either Representative Hurtas or Mr. Elwood?
With that, Representative Hurtas, closing statements. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Elwood, for helping out. I uh, appreciate all of the comments from the counties and the different associations in support of the bill. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll re renew my motion to have uh, House File 2800 laid over for possible inclusion. And thank you, Representative Hurtas, for having our first bill up in division this year go so smoothly. Uh, Representative Hurtas renews his motion that House File 2800 be laid over for possible inclusion in the property tax division report. So folks, next up on the agenda is what I like to call speed dating. Uh, we've had this beginning of session last year, but with the uh, with the chance of having a surplus, I want to make sure that interest groups that normally come before our committee would get a chance to come and talk again about what are some of their legislative priorities are. Um, I will note that the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities was unable to attend, but has provided written material in your virtual packet. Each presenter will have two minutes. Mr. Peterson will raise his hand when there's 30 seconds left, and then we will begin with uh, Gary Carlson from the League of Minnesota Cities. Mr. Carlson, please state your name for the record and proceed. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for uh, taking a few minutes here. Uh, last week, I did talk a lot about some efforts that we have undertaken as uh, city organizations to look at the LGA formula and come back with some recommendations. We'll visit with you more on that in the future. Uh, I think we've got an idea that we think uh, merits some consideration in the legislative process. So we'll be bringing a bill forward, hopefully in the very near future. So we'll we'll discuss that later. I do want to mention, though, however, um, we are still also looking for some appropriation increase for the LGA formula. Uh, although it is funded at the, the highest watermark level ever, going back to the 2002 level, uh, we're still well below the 2003 level uh, before the cuts were enacted. So we're still looking for an appropriation increase there. Uh, this isn't directly in this committee's purview, but it has a property tax impact, and that is our ongoing effort to secure the sales tax exemption for construction materials for public projects. Um, again, it might not come down to the division, but it does have a property tax impact because when cities and counties and schools pay that sales tax, uh, they're paying it through raising the property tax. So Representative Swadzinski has that bill. And uh, I think there may be another jacket floating around as well, but we'll, we'll be pushing that with the counties and the school boards uh, to try to secure that. And then uh, two other quick things. Uh, one of the things I'm hearing from a number of cities is uh, questions about Representative Marquardt's truth and taxation hearing requirements that were enacted last year. Many cities see uh, uh, they have longstanding process by which they share information with their citizenry. And many have said to me, why don't we just make that a uh, kind of a, a benchmark that cities could use if they don't have a system that they found to be successful. So I'll be talking to Representative Mark Ward about that. And then finally, one other big issue, we're hearing a lot about rising home values and the resulting property tax increases. I don't have a recommendation on that at this point, uh, but that is something that I'm hearing a lot from cities about. So Madam Chair, I'll be visiting with members throughout the throughout the session uh, to share more information and ideas. So I hope I got two minutes in there. That was fantastic. Hopefully everybody takes their cue off of you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Next, we have Matt Hilgart from the Association of Minnesota Counties. Mr. Hilgart, please state your name for the record and proceed. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Hilgart. I uh, work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. And thank you, uh, first of all, Madam Chair, thank you for hosting this round robin. This committee still is, is an active place where bipartisan solutions can get forwarded, and we've really enjoyed working with all of you on those solutions. Uh, as it relates to this committee this year, AMC's main priority will be protecting property tax base and ensuring property tax relief um, is part of any discussions towards the end of session and any of the tax bills. And specifically here, we're, we're, we're referencing two things. Uh, one, kind of preventing additional shifts. It's interesting, I was looking at state uh, auditor data from the last two decades, and the percentage of a county's budget that is raised, basically paid for by property taxes, has risen on average uh, close to 10% over the last decade alone. And so, frankly, counties and local governments are, more, are relying more on property taxes to fund their budgets. And I think that this can be attributed to a couple of things. One, um, uh, counties' mandates have grown and some of those funding resources have gone down. Uh, aids have not kept on pace with inflation. 
but also the, the percentage of the pie that's available to rely on for property taxes is getting smaller and smaller. And I know the Minnesota Asso Association of Assessing Officers is going to be looking towards some of these things uh, this year, but really protecting property tax base and additional shifts is something we'll be focused on, as well as investing in mechanisms that provide additional property tax relief. Um, so those could be, um, of course, county program aid, which uh, Matt Mossman will probably highlight a little later on today, uh, PILT, and other formats and aid programs that you guys have historically supported before. Lastly, outside of this, AMC is also working uh, with a group of uh, community, act, um, community partners that have been very strong in the passage of last year's youth homelessness prevention aid uh, to make some uh, small policy changes to hopefully implement that program a little more efficiently and effectively. And um, also working with the assessing association on discussions related to the taxation of solar installations um, and the treatment of mobile homes. So I'll let Mark Peterson uh, speak a little bit more to that later on. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time today. Thank you, Mr. Hilgart. Representative Hurtaj, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Hilgart, you mentioned uh, uh, increase by 10%. And uh, from my review of uh, property tax statements, um, it appears to me that over that period of time of the total property tax pie, that uh, in the case of what I've looked at at Hennepin County, for example, my Hennepin County uh, proportion of the total pie of, of the total tax bill has risen from about 30% to 40%. That's consistent with your statement. But I wanted to uh, clarify if you meant 10% increase in county taxes or if you meant 10% shift in the total pie. Um, Mr. Hilgard, if you can make it brief, I want to um, want to keep moving through the agenda and have everybody say their piece. And this is more for members to have their interest peaked and then go back offline and talk to the organizations um, so we can get through everybody. But uh, Mr. Hilgard, do you have a quick answer? Sure. So Representative Hertaus, I'm sorry for the confusion. What I was trying to delineate was that if you're taking a look at county's budgets, so a county sets a budget of $10 million, let's say, to, to fund their operations for the years. The percentage of that budget that they're using, they have to levy taxes to fund, has risen 10, on average 10%. So property taxes are being used more um, rather than state aids, federal resources, and other revenue streams to fund their operations, more so than ever before. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Hilgart. So folks, take notes and make sure you um, ask folks online. Think of this as... When you visit a new city and you take a city tour and then you go back and check out uh, the locations that you thought were interesting. So we're going to move on. That was a poor analogy. I apologize for that. Um, we're going to move on to Steve Fenske from the Minnesota Association of Townships. Mr. Fenske, can you please state your name for the record? and put? Hi, I'm Steve Fenske with the Minnesota Association of Townships. Thank you, Chair Joachim, for the invitation. Um, we're uh, uh, What we just heard echoes townships quite a bit. There's uh, a very limited um, taxpayer base available. Uh, it is um, decreasing uh, to public land. It's decreasing in the, in the population numbers themselves and the ability to pay a lot more folks on fixed income as it becomes a, a more aging population. Uh, so th that's been a big struggle for townships. Uh, the aids that are provided are pretty critical, whether that's uh, PILT or there is a town aid program, but that's typically been pretty low funding. We see about 10 million a year. You have uh, almost 1,800 townships. Now that money isn't distributed just town, township to township, but if you divide that out, that's only about $5,600 per township. Um, even with gravel roads, which are relatively inexpensive, it doesn't go a long way. Um, so uh, the, the township role with, with local tax um, largely works closely with the counties, and uh, we look to continue that relationship. Townships do have the ability to employ local assessors. And that's one issue we've, we've been hearing about more lately is a, a less of ability to find a private local assessor to do the work. And that's something we uh, hope to work through over some time. We're gathering some information about that. Um, last piece that, that does have a, a property tax effect is annexation, something else we've been working on uh, really in the long term. And it does have an effect on uh, townships as they, again, have a shrinking land base to work from. Uh, Chair uh, Yukim, thank you again. I will, I will leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Fenske. Uh, moving on, Patricia Nauman from Metro Cities. Ms. Nauman, please state your name for the record and proceed. 
Hey, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, nice to see all of you today. My name is Patricia Nauman. I'm the Executive Director of Metro Cities, and it's nice to be back in front of your committee today, uh, Representative Joachim, uh, Chair Joachim. Uh, just very briefly, um, Metro Cities does represent the shared interests of cities across the metropolitan region, so our jurisdiction is the seven-county metropolitan area. And the association does lobby for the collective interests of cities at the legislature, at the executive branch, and also the Metropolitan Council. And that's a unique role that the association plays in the world of, of local government advocacy. With respect to the property tax division, uh, Metro City's policies do touch on several issues. Um, basically, uh, local government aid that Mr. Carlson had previously mentioned, and we testified on that uh, last week, and I'm sure you'll hear from us again as the session proceeds. Um, other issues. Uh, such as the sales tax exemption for construction materials um, is also something that Metro Cities does support fixing. And I know it has uh, some nexus, but not entirely with this uh, division. The issue of fiscal disparities, uh, the fiscal disparities program is something that Metro City supports and keeps a close eye on when there are proposals. Other issues such as the 4D uh, classification program, issues like tax increment financing, levy limits, um, certainly budget requirements, all those are issues that uh, Metro Cities does have legislative policy positions on and you'll find us responding to issues as they arise. I also just want to briefly say, uh, Madam Chair and members, that overall Metro Cities, sort of the common thread through many of our legislative positions is the is support and emphasis on the need for a strong state and local partnership. So the partnership that exists between the state legislature, the executive branch and local governments um, one that emphasizes uh, good communication, uh, good public stewardship for resources, and certainly adequate resources for cities to meet local needs and certainly state mandates. So I will leave it there and thank you again for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you, Ms. Nauman. Next up, we have um, Matt Mossman from Minnesota Intercounty Association. Mr. Mossman, please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and committee members, Matt Mossman, Executive Director of the Minnesota Inter-County Association. Uh, MICA is a voluntary association uh, of 15 of Minnesota's larger and faster growing counties, including four suburban and 11 in greater Minnesota. As has been noted that, you know, counties, as you know, have a unique and longstanding partnership with the state, and they really do play an essential role in providing the public services that Minnesotans rely on every day. My written uh, testimony that I submitted contains a link to our full list of 2022 priorities. But just to sort of note, while this is the property tax division, it's important to sort of understand that broad work counties um, do. And we also have uh, a perspective in our platform priorities related to continuum of, of housing infrastructure needs across the state, supporting funding policies that effectively respond to the growing mental health crisis, uh, fulfilling border-to-border -border, uh, broadband public safety and other issues. Um, related to property taxes, Madam Chair and members, MICA's legislative priorities really align with Minnesota's tradition of a strong intergovernmental finance relationship. And in reality, uh, and the reality, I should say, that state funding often diminishes during lean budget years and ideally, hopefully, rebounds uh, during periods of greater uh, state budget flexibility. Um, specifically, Madam Chair, we do hope to work with you uh, and all committee members throughout this, uh, this legislative session to increase county program aid, um, which is about uh, at the same level today as it was uh, 20 years ago in nominal dollar terms. It has fallen from about 17% of total county uh, levy uh, and aid to about 7.3% today. Um, county program aid helps all property taxpayers in the state um, as all counties receive county program aid. As has been mentioned, we are also strong supporters of enacting a general law refund exemption for the sales tax on construction materials. Um, we would like you to, uh, or the tax committee to look at exempting counties as towns are exempted from the motor vehicle sales tax on road maintenance equipment purchases. And uh, we would uh, support uh, looking at and reinforcing um, payments uh, in lieu of taxes, um, out of home placement, and other uh, needs that hit uh, individual counties uh, disproportionately. Uh, finally, Madam Chair, Minnesota's property tax system is already extraordinarily complex. Um, as the legislature considers individual proposals uh, aimed at providing tax benefits and tax relief, whether it be for 
on certain taxpayers or classes of property, we do encourage uh, the legislature to maintain local control over property valuation and levy decisions um, to help simplify uh, and make the property tax system more transparent wherever we can and resist changes that increase complexity, complexity um, or that deliver tax benefits by shifting uh, additional property tax burden onto other classes of property. Those are the highlights, Madam Chair. Thank you again for your time. Um, look forward, Chair Uquim, to working with you and other committee members throughout the session. Thank you, Mr. Mossman. And that was the perfect segue into our next person, Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers, Ms. Mark Peterson. Could you please state your name for the record and proceed? My name is Mark Peterson. I am here representing the Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers. I'm also the county assessor for Cass County. And uh, Matt has already uh, touched on a few of our objectives, but uh, a prime a uh, concern of ours has always been property tax classification simplification, and it kind of folds in with some of the other items that others have talked about. So we will be looking at uh, a possible introductions of, of a bill that would are getting some help on that to actually start with simplifying the residential, uh, maybe looking at a house as a house. Other things we're working on are the manufactured home taxation as far as the personal property map manufactured homes and it has to do with the tracking of the ownership that's a huge concern among jurisdictions as far as how to track the owners how to who to tax how to collect that tax so we're looking for a way to improve that matt also touched on the solar farms this is in no way an anti-solar initiative it's strictly uh, a way to properly classify the land underneath those solar systems to make it more uniform with how we say tax uh, uh, the land under a billboard or a, a cell tower site. We are also concerned about uh, any type of property tax base loss when that comes down to any types of exclusions. So we, we have ideas on how to better administer some of these benefits on some of these programs without further expanding the exclusions. Uh, in, when it comes to rising home values, we would love to be involved with any uh, conversations on those uh, also because we do have ideas or, or solutions that may work when it comes to that. We appreciate the opportunity to visit. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, sorry, I was trying to catch up with the notes here. Um, so next up, we have Eric Bernstein from We Make Minnesota. Mr. Bernstein, please state your name for the record and proceed. Chair Joachim, members of the committee, my name is Eric Bernstein and I'm policy director for We Make Minnesota, which is a coalition of labor and community groups united around the importance of state funding for a more prosperous and equitable Minnesota. Uh, I want to thank the committee for having us here today to discuss our priorities. It's been great to hear from local units of government, so I'll begin by sharing our hope that this committee will support them and the needs of the communities they represent. A recent Star Tribune article described the growth in local option sales tax proposals aimed at funding rec centers, public safety facilities, and other community projects. We feel this is yet another sign of statewide underfunding that really shouldn't persist with the surplus on hand. Last session, the tax committee heard 22 local option proposals representing a combined $570 million of needed funding. Additionally, this year, Local governments submitted $1.45 billion in bonding requests, only $386 million of which were included in Governor Walz's recommendations. From conversations with local officials, it's clear these requests represent just the tip of the iceberg in terms of their need for affordable housing, infrastructure, and more. More broadly, the ramifications of widespread underfunding are clearer than ever. A labor crisis in our schools, hospitals, and nursing homes, the worst housing shortage in the country, and some of America's deepest racial disparities. This committee has much to say about the collection and distribution of revenue across the state, so our organization's priority will be to insist that it does so with Minnesota's pressing challenges in mind. The property tax system has historically been a cog in the wheel of structural racism and geographic inequity, but it can also be a great mechanism for, deliver, um, for delivering assistance. We aim to support policies that will provide a more sufficient and equitable distribution of our collective resources. Uh, we understand that the committee will discuss uh, tax reductions this session. We are hoping for honesty in those conversations. Uh, Minnesotans have heard enough about the magical properties of corporate tax cuts, and we have learned that trading needed investment for nominal relief does not help us in the long run. Um, funding issues aside, we also recognize that paying property taxes is an onerous and unpopular process, 
and we'd be interested in programs to establish automated monthly payments or other means of easing compliance. Um, we look forward to many in-depth discussions and thank, thanks again for having us. Thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. And next up, we have Jill Larson from Minnesota Business Partnership. Ms. Larson, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Jill Larson with the Minnesota Business Partnership. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments today about business property taxes. My comments are gonna be very high level because the next two testifiers are gonna go into more details and we didn't wanna provide duplicative testimony. First, I wanna say thank you for last year's tax bill that included some reduction in the state general levy, what we call the state business property tax. Uh, we did appreciate that the proposal that exempted the first $150,000 of market value was accompanied by an overall reduction in the levy so there wasn't shifting onto other business properties. So thank you for that. That proposal in our view was necessary and helpful because Minnesota has really high business property taxes relative to other states. And that puts Minnesota employers at a competitive disadvantage. Businesses bear a higher uh, property tax burden than other properties because they both they pay both a higher local property tax rate and they also pay the state general levy, which um, only other, the only other business, the only other properties that pay that are cabin properties. And the business property tax impacts employers of all sizes, including those that don't own their building, but they pay the state property tax through their lease. And the state's ability to compete with other locations um, for business retention, business expansion is um, important to job growth. So we don't want to do anything that's going to make it more expensive to locate or expand here. So I guess our ask for this session is that you, as you develop your division report, we would ask that you would consider further reducing the state general levy on all business property. And we would appreciate that approach rather than increasing the exemption level even further, because as that level gets increased, the tax pretty much just starts to fall on metro area properties because they're uh, typically higher valued. So appreciate the time today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Next up, we've got Beth Kadoon from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Kadoon, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Beth Kadoon with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. We represent more than 6,300 businesses across the state, employing more than a half a million people. We advocate for policies to strengthen our business climate and to help the state's economy grow. I'll just provide a little background so then you understand um, some of the policies we're working on and why. There was a really great report that the Minnesota Chamber Foundation undertook to review the state's economy and what is needed for future success. That report's called the Minnesota 2030 Report. And it found that Minnesota grew faster than the U.S. for decades, with job growth exceeding national job growth for 27 of 35 years from 1970 to 2004. Since 2005, however, Minnesota's economy has grown more slowly than the U.S., with both our job growth and GDP lagging the U.S. for most of those years. While many factors contribute to overall economic growth, states with higher levels of in-migration and lower business costs have captured an increasing share of growth in the U.S. economy. Minnesota cannot continue to be both a low population growth state and a high business cost state if it is to support economic growth in the coming years. We believe this session with the large surplus in the non-budget year provides a great opportunity to reduce those areas where Minnesota is the most uncompetitive and is a barrier to investment and growth in our state. And that's the state levy is one of those that Ms. Larson mentioned. This is an area where Minnesota still ranks in the top 10 highest and much higher than all our neighboring states. There's a great report also by the um, Lincoln Institute and the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Ex Excellence on their 50 state comparison study. And just a few examples of those um, on how Minnesota compares. For a rural commercial business property with $1 million of market value, Minnesota ranks second highest with a $32,600 tax. That is about double North Dakota and South Dakota and higher than all our neighboring states. It's even maybe surprising, Minnesota's tax is even two and a half times higher than California's, which is at $12,640. For that same property in the urban area, Minnesota actually ranks a little better at 10th highest, but we're still about two and a half times higher than um, North Dakota and South Dakota. We thank this committee and the legislators for the work that has been made in the past session to reduce the state levy, um, and would urge you to continue to reduce this regressive high fixed cost of doing business in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kadu. Next up, we have um, Mr. Smith. Uh, uh, sorry, 
We have Sean Smith from NIAP. Mr. Smith, will you state your name for the record and proceed and also um, explain the acronym because I have it on here and I keep forgetting. So thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, my name is Sean Smith and uh, I'm the uh, Public Policy Committee Chair for NAOP Minnesota. Uh, we are the leading organization for commercial real estate owners and developers. And in this role, I'm a proud volunteer serving my industry today. In our profession, we really view ourselves as um, providing the, um, the physical infrastructure for all the businesses that operate in our state. Um, I'd like to briefly discuss two key priorities today. Uh, first, and hopefully the easiest, is to simply extend the state historic structure rehab rehabilitation tax credit. Uh, ideally, this extension is for five years or longer. Uh, this really helps accommodate the long project times for these types of uh, projects, uh, and that really depends on the certainty of this credit being in place. The great thing about this credit is that it's been used all over the state for buildings of all sizes, and it's really a great tool to bring federal dollars in our state. Um, uh, Chair Yuakim, I want to thank you and all of the other members for uh, your past support on this and uh, really continuing to champion this. Uh, second priority, um, we have historically supported the reduction in the state historic or the state general levy that applies to CNI property. Uh, however, today uh, we feel it's most prudent to eliminate or phase out this tax altogether. Um, this tax is clearly unique in many, many ways, but most importantly, Minnesota is the only state to have such a tax on a specific property type in the entire nation. Um, property taxes are a local matter, and this levy adds approximately 30% on top of all the municipal local taxes, which, by the way, we don't have any problem paying. Um, it's important to note that real estate taxes are directly passed through to the businesses that occupy these buildings. So eliminating this levy would provide a uniform and much needed way to give businesses all over the state much needed relief, who quite frankly are still dealing with the issues around this pandemic and now inflation. So uh, thanks for those on this committee who have um, supported that uh, reduction efforts in the past, and I appreciate all the time allotted today and will certainly make myself available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, next up, we have Roz Peterson from the Minnesota Shopping Center Association. Ms. Peterson, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Joachim and members of the Property Tax Division. I am Roz Peterson on behalf of the Minnesota Shopping Center Association and CCIM Minnesota Dakota's chapter. MSCA has over 600 members that represent retail center owners, brokers, developers, property managers, appraisers, retailers, contractors, architects, and other vendors. CCIM is a nonprofit commercial real estate education international member organization. We agree with the others that have already spoken in regards to reducing or eliminating the state general levy, but from a different perspective. MSCA represents brick and mortar communities, which the pandemic has forced closures, shifted consumer shopping patterns, and sustained hardship for our members and tenants. Already, our retail bankruptcies exceed the financial crisis of 2008. Any reductions to the state general levy will help our small businesses and local communities. Small business owners like Allie and Drew Hansen of the Vine Room and women of color owned businesses like Mini Row Market will be helped since all property tax is passed along to the tenants. Also, in order to be fair, we feel it's important to reduce the overall levy versus expanding the exclusion deduction, which benefits some, but not all people. After all, the state general levy is already a small number of people paying a significant portion of the overall property tax. Thank you for listening, your consideration, your service to our state, and for your time. Thank you, Ms. Peterson, and thank you for owning businesses in Hopkins. Um, <laughs> next up, we have Nan Madden from the Minnesota Budget Project. Ms. Madden, please state your name for the record and proceed. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nan Madden. I'm director of the Minnesota Budget Project. The Minnesota Budget Project is an initiative of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Our mission is to identify and advance public policy changes to make Minnesota a place where everyone can thrive, regardless of who they are or where they live. We work primarily in the areas of tax, budget, and economic policy, and especially how those policy areas impact lower income Minnesotans and communities of color. Uh, in regards for this committee, that translates into support for the property tax refunds that impact lower income Minnesotans and communities of color, uh, particularly the renter's credit, and also an interest in the important role that aids to local governments play in ensuring that all Minnesotans have access to quality public services and thriving communities. We believe that the resources available in the 2022 legislative session uh, represent a historic opportunity and that the path to a stronger, more equitable recovery is through investing in Minnesotans, their families, and their communities, focusing on those hardest hit by the pandemic, as well as the disparities and disinvestment that preceded it. Our top priority before this committee is to expand the renter's credit, providing both larger credit amounts and reaching more Minnesotans. The renter's credit is a powerful tool the state uses to put a limit on how much a, a family's budget can go towards property taxes. It provides a refund of property taxes that renters have paid through their rents. Uh, the renter's credit is important to uh, renters all across the state and in many uh, greater Minnesota counties, it's especially important for our seniors and people living with severe disabilities. We think the renter's credit has never been more important than now in these times of rising rents, tight incomes for renters and the heavy impact of the pandemic on lower income people and people of color. And another high priority for us is removing arbitrary restrictions that are keeping some homeowners from gaining homestead status on their homes. Uh, I look forward to additional conversation with the committee and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Madden. Um, I think I believe we're to our final one. Um, Sheila Vaney with the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Ms. Vaney, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Sheila Vanny and I'm the Assistant Director with the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. We represent the state's 88 SWCDs, their 440 elected board members and their over 400 conservation professionals. As many of you know, we've been trying to solve the issue of state funding for SWCDs for several years. We're grateful for the clean water funds that SWCs have been receiving the past four biennia, but every two years poses new challenges for us. The concept of SWCD aid is something that we've been thinking about for several years as a standing general fund appropriation to SWCDs through the Department of Revenue and the current budget conditions we feel present an opportunity to finally resolve this. We would love the committee's support um, of this approach and uh, we look forward to visiting with you more about it as session progresses. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you and I am so sorry that I butchered your name there a little bit. Um, folks, we have finished our little speed dating round. I should have given everybody about one more minute. I just was not sure how we'd work with timing and people signing up. So I know Wednesdays are, um, well, first, I hope all of you were taking notes and had a chance to figure out who you need to talk to about some of the bills that you might want to carry. Um, that was kind of the point of this whole exercise. And I know how crazy busy people's Wednesdays are. So I'd like to give you some of your time back. First, I just wanted to give you an update. Next week, we're going to be hearing um, three or four bills that will be posted very soon. And then uh, the Department of Revenue will briefly present the Voss report and some of the changes from last year. And if we have time, we'll move on then to briefly hear about the 4D report that just came out. So um, I want to make sure, uh, uh, Representative Hurtas, did you have any, any questions or anything to add before we adjourn? I find the uh, mute button, sorry. Uh, thank you for the question, but no, uh, you've uh, summed it up very well and uh, thank you for the uh, presenters uh, in today's meetings.
Thank you, Representative Hurtas. And with that, folks, have some little bit more time uh, put back into your agenda or into your agenda. You can tell I have not had enough coffee today, and this is my fourth committee hearing. So I'm going to give everybody some time back in their day today. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>